Um, chairwoman, I said. <laughs> um, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for the organizers in particular, Didier, Hubert, Jan, to uh, invite me here. Uh, can you hear me? Can the people online also hear me? That's important, I think. <laughs> Before yes, going. The microphone is on. So okay. Yes, yes, okay, wonderful. Okay, thank you very much. So I will start. So my, uh, as I said, I'm Peter Krüger from the University of Chiba in Japan. Um, if you're not familiar with the map in Japan, uh, it, Chiba is in the greater Tokyo region. And if you ever go to Japan, and you might go to the international airport of Tokyo and then go into central Tokyo, and in this way you have a good chance to come through Chiba without even knowing it. So it's uh, 40 kilometers away from Tokyo. I will talk today about the multi-channel multiple scattering theory and in the second part about the beta salpeta equation and all these uh, two uh, approaches uh, in order to understand better particle hole effects in X-ray uh, absorption spectra. Oh, never works. Never works, no. Go out of zoom window. Also, no. No. no? Uh, okay. So here's the outline of my talk. Uh, in the first part, which takes probably two thirds, uh, we talk about multi-channel multiple scattering theory, in short MSMC. And in that, I will start with a toy model for multiplet structure and absorption spectroscopy, and then I will uh, go into the theory and show you uh, quite a number of examples especially for L edge, uh, so 2P uh, spectra. And in the second part, I will talk about the beta salt peta equation approach, again, for X-ray absorption, or in general, absorption spectroscopy, and uh, in particular, X-ray absorption spectroscopy. Now, I think you have heard about the beta salt peta equation already uh, last week by Professor uh, Janisch. And uh, I, I couldn't attend it, but I saw the slides. I think it's very different. I mean, the peter peter equation is a famous two-particle equation. Is it used in many, uh, for many problems? And so I will focus on absorption spectroscopy. And uh, Professor Janis uh, focused on superconductivity and other two-particle things, I think. So, <coughs> but I'm not an expert, really, on the peter peter equation approach. And so, well, I will try to give you as much information as possible for this problem. Now, the first part, I think I'm an expert, and uh, here are some uh, references. If you're interested to go further into what I'm talking today, um, some reference about the multi-channel multi multiple scattering theory. So, so, I think you have heard a lot about multiple scattering theory already. So, what is new when we talk about multi-channel? multiple scattering theory. I will try to explain to that to you, it's not so simple. But if you normally, I think what you have heard until now is mainly the normal, so the standard multiple scattering theory, and this is potential scattering. So a particle comes in, hits a potential, and is scattered. So it's a one particle theory, normally. Okay, and, but if you think about what we use this uh, scattering theory for, except for a really one particle problems like a hydrogenic atom where we have only one electron, then this is fine. But most often we are interested in complex atoms, molecules, solids, and so on. We have many particles inter interaction. And then, of course, you have problems because when an electron is scattered at a target, like an atom, multi electron atom, or solid, and so on, uh, then there might be some correlation effects. So to come back to the standard theory, which is much useful, very much used and very important, to be able to use the standard multiple scattering theory, actually you assume that your many electron problem can be reduced to an effective one electron problem by some mean field approach, like hartree fock cohn charm and so on. And you replace the, the potential is a static potential, is a potential scattering, as I said. So it's not time dependent and so on. 
So the, in other words, the target electrons will not react to the incoming electron. It's a mean field approach. But in the reality, it's a bit more complicated. The, the target electrons feel the Coulomb interaction with a scattered electron, and they react and rearrange dynamically. So the potential seen in, quote unquote, seen by the incoming particle is a dynamic potential. So it's time or frequency dependent. Okay, it depends on where the particle is. When it comes in, the Coulomb interaction will change at course of time. So in binary Fourier analysis, it, it's frequency dependent. Okay. So this is a complicated electron correlation problem with one continuum electron. If you think about a scattering problem, one electron hits the target. So we have this electron at least is in a continuum state. And so we have a uh, correlated problem with one, at least one continuum, one particle in a continuum state. And so now I think quickly about inelastic scattering, although I don't go into it, it's not my main target. But inelastic scattering, of course, happens. And what does it mean if when the particle comes in, it excites the system, right? So there is some energy and other quantum number transfer from the, uh, uh, from the electron to the target. And when the electron goes out, the rest system will be in an excited state, right? So an eigenstate of the ionized system, uh, sorry, of the target system. Right? So here, in inelastic scattering, is very clear the idea of the channel. So when the, the, the scattering process can end up the target in different excited states. And these excited states you may call channels. Now, as I said, I'm not particularly interested in inelastic scattering. This was a uh, subject for on its own. But even in elastic scattering, you have this uh, phenomenon, because even though the the electron after a collision might have the same energy as coming in, during the collision process it might uh, trigger virtual excitations. Okay, and this is exactly what multi-channel scattering is about. So, <coughs> in a picture way, I say it again. Uh, the channels where I'm talking about will be the target eigenstates. And while the usual potential scattering, the target is always in its ground state. Okay, this would be the single channel theory. I say it again, the reality is that the target electrons rearrange dynamically during the scattering process. And uh, we use usually the, the time independent scattering picture which means we have virtual transitions to higher lying eigenstates. And so we become a multi-channel problem. So here's a picture of it. Imagine that you have the, the electron in some, with some kinetic energy, which is represented here as a, a level, the, the energy of the incoming electron. And you have a, an electron, uh, an atom, in its ground state. And then the scattering happens. And at this process, because of strong Coulomb interaction, the, during the process, the atom might be excited to a higher state, which I call here <laughs> the bigger uh, circle of, uh, for the atom. But since we are interested in elastic process, at the same time, the energy of the electron will be reduced, because the total energy is the same. So we have here the process. These channels can interact. So this is an excited state of the target and some lower energy of the electron. And this is the uh, most elastic channel, the, so the ground state of the target. So this is a picture of the multi-channel problem. So, <coughs> so the multi-channel scattering theory, the idea is to expand the L N electron wave function. By N is now it all the electrons. So the, the scattered electron and uh, the target electron. So expand the n electron wave function that we want to compute over a set of n minus 1 electron state, so the target state. And this should be the eigenstates of the target system. And these eigenstates are called channels. So we have then 
it's not exactly configuration interaction like the chemists call it, but it's a configuration mixing uh, between one continuum state and uh, a number of uh, bound states of the uh, target. So this uh, multi-channel scattering theory has been used first in nuclear physics and later in atomic physics since the mid-60s. And it's well established. And the first version of it is called closed coupling expansion. It's what I just described in words, that you expand your n electron wave functions over a set of n minus 1 target eigenstates. And later came the so-called R matrix methods, which have some advantages. Um, so it's configuration interaction with one continuum state. So uh, now, what I've talked so far, the picture was a target, a localized target, like a nucleus or a, an, yeah, or a multi-electron atom. But now we are, um, I think most of you are mostly interested in condensed matter or molecules, and then this is of course not enough. The electron is moving around and uh, having a lot of band structure and molecular orbitals and whatsoever. And so we, for the atom, this theory is well known, but uh, in a solid, we cannot do just with the normal uh, one potential scattering. The natural e extension of that is the multiple scattering. So what if we understand the multi-channel problem in the atom and then let the electron do multiple scattering, we might have a chance to solve the problem completely. So I will not talk about multi, multiple scattering here because you have heard a lot, I think, already last week. So the idea is to uh, solve the many side scattering problem by decomposing it into one side scattering, described by phase shifts or T matrices, and propagation between the scatterers. And the m important quantity is the scattering path operator, tau. Now, as I just said, uh, it was a, is a well-established theory in atomic nuclear physics, but for solids it had not been applied until 1990, where Rino Anatoly and co-workers wrote this paper, Multi-Channel Multiple Scattering Theory with General Potentials. So this is the birth of multi-channel multiple scattering theory. Yes, but the, the n minus 1 target states yes, are eigenstates. Exactly. They might already have configuration direction itself. Yes. It's not excluded at this point. I'll come back to this point later. Okay, It doesn't exclude the, uh, the correlation between the rest electrons. So what is this uh, theory good for? Well, in principle, it applies to all uh, electron scattering phenomena, such uh, low electron, low energy electron diffraction or something. And, but so far it has been implemented by me and others only for X-ray absorption spectroscopy. And uh, the main motivation for Reno Natoli at the time um, was uh, uh, experiments of this kind here on the figure uh, to treat the coupling between the photoelectron and the cohol and other electrons. And, uh, well, this is what I will also do. So the first motivation was, as I said, um, satellite features in copper KH uh, X-ray absorption of copper oxides. And here's the figure. If you see this figure, this is a copper KH absorption spectrum in uh, a high TC cuprate, lanthanum copper oxide. And uh, there's many graphs, this is, it's a polarization dependence, it's not so important. Say this one, a certain polarization, is this spectrum here. And if you do just a normal one electron theory, a standard multiple scattering theory uh, calculation, for example, you would see just one peak, essentially, and not this extra peak here. And the peak separation between these two turns out to be some 10 electron volts. And it, it's always, for other polarizations, it's shifted, but it's always the same. So it's a replica of two states. And the people have understood that very quickly. If you look at the core level for the emission spectrum of this compound, you see two sharp peaks. 
even in 1S, yeah, in 1S, in 1S uh, core level photo emission, while in one electron theory you expect only one peak. And so this is a called satellite peak in XPS, and in this compound it's very strong, with more, almost the same intensity. And this is explained by the fact that when you suddenly create a core hole by photo excitation, co core level excitation, here is such a fact that uh, you fi end up the final state by the screening of the core hole cannot be described by a single Slater determinant, but at least by two configurations, not even by one electron configuration, but you need at least two configurations, which is uh, usually called uh, like this. So it's a core hole, a 3D10, no, let's say this one is a natural one. Kappa is D9, 3D9 normally. So the net normal uh, final state would be core hole and 3D9 and one electron in a high continuum. But there is another channel which is where the electrons from the oxygen screen the hole uh, by filling the, the, the missing hole in valence band. And so you have a 3D10 configuration. And they have an energy difference, and that's why you get two peaks. So this was understood, but now <coughs> I will come back to it later how we can treat it. So this was the first uh, motivation. And now if the electron on top of that is slow, meaning we are not at very high energy, then you expect coupling between these two channels. So this was the motivation for Rin and Atoli, the beginning. Oh, so I forget. Now, I did not solve this problem, really. <laughs> but I was more interested in uh, multiplet couplings. Uh, and well, anyway, it's, this is an example, and multiplet is another example of uh, correlation effects in final state correlation effects in X-ray absorption. So now I will talk more about multiplet problems. And I don't know if you know the term multiplet. Now we have heard about multiple scattering a lot. Now multi-channel, now even multiplets. There's a lot of multi. So what is multiplet now? I don't know if you are aware of it. Probably many are, others not. So I will, will give a short summary of what we understand by multiplet. A multiplet is a term from atomic physics. And it just says that for the same electron configuration, so think about copper atom, 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. So you know you have two electrons on the 2p level. That's the ground state. So in a just simple picture, you expect one energy for this thing. But if you do spectroscopy, you see there's not one energy, but there are many levels, which are all the same configuration. And then, there's, so there's the, the level is split in different in sublevels, which are called multiplets. Multiplets means you have a degeneracy for each of these levels. So if the degeneracy is one, if the level has only one state, it's a singlet. If it's two, it's a doublet, and so on. So this is the idea of the multiplet. And why now are these levels split? The main reason here is the Coulomb interaction between the electrons. So for the same configuration, when the electrons occupy different spin orbitals, their Coulomb interaction is different, and that's why you have different levels. So this is the uh, multiplets. So uh, to have, again, this example um, of carbon 2p, um, what do you have to do to find the multiplets for this problem? Now, in the free atom, the spin, the total spin and the to total angular momentum, L, are good quantum numbers, neglecting spin-orbit coupling for this at this point. And so you have these two shells are filled. They have neither orbital moment nor spin moment. You have only to worry about the 2p2. So you have two electrons with uh, L equal 1 and both spin 1 half. Then you have to sum spins. You can sum spin 1 half to, to get a triplet, spin equal 1 or a singlet, if they're anti-parallel, spin equals zero. OK, you think you all know that. And you can do the same for the angular momentum. So you have two angular momentum, L equal one. This L equal one can be summed to L equal total L two, or one, or zero. So this gives you, in principle, six possibilities. But by Pauli principle, <laughs> we cannot do not see them all. 
Well, I make a long, strong, long story short. There are three multiplets. One is L equal to S equal 0 in spectroscopic terms called D1. Then there's L equal 1, S equal 1, 3P, and L equal 0, S equal 0, 1, S. So the terms, the states of each of these terms are degenerate. So here there are 5, here there are 9, here's 1. But the energy of the different levels is very different, and this is due to the Coulomb in exchange interaction. Okay. So now I come to a toy model to explain why this multiplet effect is very important in certain uh, spectroscopy, especially X-ray absorption spectroscopy, where I mean what I'm mostly interested in. So we consider really a toy F model where um, my core level is a 1s electron, and we make a transition to a 2p state, like here. And I consider a ground state like helium, 1s2. So this is my ground state configuration, and if I make now an, an uh, optical absorption to 2p, I could put one of these electrons here, right? So I would expect exactly one level. Right. There's only one chance. I mean, the energy is fixed, the energy difference. So which is just one line, okay? This is the one electron picture. Now let's think about the many electron state, including this multiplet effect we just explained. Now you have to think about the, the ground state. Now I think about many electron states and many electron energies. The ground state is a S1 configuration. Spin equals zero, orbital momentum, momentum equals zero. No doubt about that. And now, but in the excited state, I have one electron in a 2p state. And I've just learned you have to see how to couple orbital and spin momenta together. And there are several possibilities. In this case, um, you have L equal 0 and L equal 1. It can only be total L equal 1. So the total state is a P state. But the spin can be parallel or anti-parallel, and it's called the triplet here and the singlet. And these two have very different energy, very depending, have a different energy and the, the energy difference is determined by an exchange integral, the Coulomb integral, exchange integral, um, called J1S2P. So now you have a quite different picture. But if you did now X, uh, absorption spectra, um, from this main electron state to one of these, actually you cannot go to this one, at least not in normal optical uh, transition, because in optical transition the spin is conserved. You cannot go from the singlet to a triplet. So here you would still see only one peak. So maybe the energy is a little bit different, but in the mean field approach you could still probably fix that problem. And you would not have a very different picture in the end. However, if you now put switch on the spin orbit interaction, then you will feel, see a real difference between the two pictures. So again, we have our 1s, uh, 2s, uh, 1s2 ground state. And now in the one electron picture, what do you do if you have spin orbit coupling? The 2p state will split into two sublevels of good total angular momentum j, either 3 halves or 1 half. And the difference, the splitting, is a certain number, which will usually be small for light elements. Now we look at the many electron picture. So, uh, sorry. Now, if you do not do now extra absorption uh, from one of these, then of course you see two lines. And if you count the uh, multiplicities and the oscillator strengths, which are the same, you would have a ratio here between two and one. And the splitting is very small, corresponding to the spin orbit splitting. Now, if you look at the many electron picture, we have still the same ground state. This cannot change. We have still these two final state due to Coulomb interaction, but now the spin orbit coupling will lift this nine degenerate state into multiplets of one, three, and five states, according to total angular momentum J, zero, one, or two, because the spin and the, the orbital will also couple and make a difference according to the spin orbit coupling. So these splittings is of this order. My picture is not so precise. Okay. <coughs> Okay, now we have many states. Okay, now what happens if we do now absorption? 
we go from here again to this. Now, since there has been orbital coupling, I do not have any more conservation of spin and orbital moment alone. So what I can only say is that the J is conserved. So this is the J equal, um, excuse me, the J will be increased by 1. And the J increased by 1 means that you go from G equals zero, J equals 0 to 1. So it can be this state as before, or it can be this state. Now, well, I will go much more into detail. There is a coupling between these two. So this is not a pure 3P state anymore. Otherwise, it would be the intensity would be 0. So in the end, if you calculate then the oscillator strength, you will get this spectrum. The main is still this one, but you have a small contribution here in this one, which is not anymore forbidden by the selection rules. So now look at these two spectra. Now they are really completely different. So this is the one electron picture. You have a small splitting due to the spin orbit coupling. Here you have a huge splitting due to the Coulomb interaction. So you can see here in this, I hope you can see in this uh, simple model that these multiplet effects can have a dramatic effect on uh, X-ray absorption spectra, especially if you have strong Coulomb interaction and spin orbit couplings. Okay, now I go really into the formalism. And now I have many formula and maybe it goes a bit too fast, so I invite you to, to read it carefully, uh, look at it once again later. So I will be interested in the X-ray absorption spectrum. <coughs> Um, and I will use Fermi's golden rule, and you all know that. So the extra absorption spectrum is essentially up to some um, constants, is given by the matrix element squared here, where T is my optical um, <coughs> transition operator, which might be E times R or A times P, something like that. And you have uh, energy conservation. So it's essentially this, this matrix element that has to be calculated. So in order to do, to calculate this uh, spectroscopy exactly, you would have to find the eigenstates of your system for the ground state and for all possible reachable final states. Now, n electron wave functions are always very difficult, except for atoms and small molecules, it's very hard. So <coughs> the idea now uh, in this multi-channel theory is to say, you first you split your Hamiltonian into a n minus 1 electron part, which is the target, as I said. In this case, it's all the electrons apart from the excited one. And then there is this one electron that you have select, selected. Uh, and this is a one particle Hamiltonian, so kinetic energy and potential, static potential energy. And then you have the interaction between this selected electron and the others. And this is, of course, the Coulomb interaction. So here, counting all electrons from 1 to n minus 1. And the last one that I have selected is the one that makes the transition. OK. So far, nothing, no approximations. So now we say, in order to calculate this object here, we can always write a ground state, whatever correlated, as long as the, the core level is filled, as an anti-symmetrized product between the co this one core spin orbital and the rest. This is written here. I don't put anti-symmetrization, but it's always understood. It's not really a product state, it's anti-symmetrized product state. And now I make the assumption that we can do the same kind of trick for the final state. But it's an assumption. So I say also the final state, where the electron is excited, would be written as an anti-symmetrized product between some um, eigenstate of the n minus 1 system, so corresponding to this Hamiltonian, and the um, one electron state corresponding to this Hamiltonian. And then <coughs> the total energy would be the sum of the two. In mean field, you can add the interaction, but it's just the sum. And the summing over all final state means summing over all excited states of the n minus 1 system, which are labeled by alpha, and all states of the one elect selected electron system. So now we have to calculate the overlap or the matrix element between uh, this and this with some uh, optical transition operator. And in principle, we have two terms, but one can be said to be zero because it's the direct overlap between the core level and the excited state. It can be made zero. So then we have only one term, 
which is the overlap between the ground state wave function, where you have made uh, one hole in the core level, and then a true eigenstate of the n minus 1 system. This is called S alpha. This is this matrix element. And this object, which is the normal one particle transition matrix element between the core orbital and the excited orbital in the continuum. So I call this guy here S alpha. So we have S alpha times the normal matrix element. <coughs> and if you put this matrix element into the Fermi's golden rule, you have, you have this one by summing. <coughs> and now you can recognize by a small transformation that you can make appear the XPS spectrum. What is the XPS spectrum? I told you before, in this kappa example, you make an excitation. Normally, in the most simple way, you just see one delta line, but, well, it's not so simple. By the sudden creation of the core hole, you can shake up the system and you can see different excited states of the target system. And so this is the XPS general uh, <coughs> spectral form in a sudden approximation, so-called. And, okay. and so using this, we can write the extra absorption spectrum as a convolution between the XPS and the one particle absorption spectrum. And now, if you have understood the very, very beginning here, this is exactly what we see here. So what I told you before is if we do a one particle calculation, we just see one peak with some fine structure later. But now, according to the formula I just showed you, you have to convolute that with the XPS, which has two peaks of about the same height, and then you get this replica. Okay. So this is uh, a multi-channel effect. Okay. But for so far, we have said there is no correlation between the excited electron and the rest. But there is. So we have to put that also in. <coughs> um, yes. So if there is a uh, correlation between the excited electron and the rest system, you can always write, make a configuration interaction ansatz. So you say, before we had alpha times k, and now we say we make a sum over different alphas with the corresponding k with co coefficients. You can always do that. There is no problem with that. It's always anti-symmetrized, I remind you, I, although I don't write it. And if you do that, and now you plug this kind of wave function into the total Hamiltonian, which I've shown you before, then you end up with this kind of equation for the channel, the excited electron channel functions k alpha. And the mysterious thing here is the v alpha beta, which is a matrix element between the, I didn't write it down, sorry, uh, of this Hamiltonian with the uh, excitation, uh, with a different target eigenstate. But the calculation of this multi-channel, uh, inter-channel potential is very difficult, I will say. Later, come back to that. So, again, in a picture, <coughs> I told you a few times, you have the scattered electron K, al K and sigma, uh, maybe, spin, and your target system in alpha, and then it can be scattered in another state. And you have coupling between these different channels. So this is clearly shown in this equation. If this was zero, then you would have normal one particle scattering theory. Because this is a non-zero, you have coupling between the different channels. Okay. <coughs> so this approach, if we take this, and we don't, we'll see how we can calculate it really, but at the moment, we we take this kind of approach, what will our multiple scattering theory become? So multiple scattering, I think you have learned, is that the most important probably uh, object is the scattering path operator, in a certain formulation at least. And the scattering path operator, what is it? It's uh, somehow the probability to that uh, some spherical wave at side i uh, comes out as a spherical wave with a different angular momentum at another side, uh, transition probability. And so if I can calculate this uh, multi-channel, uh, multi-scaring path operator, I can, I can almost say my problem is solved. So what I have now introduced are these 
channel functions, so the internal degrees of freedom of my target object, labeled alpha. So my whole theory becomes uh, that the scattering path operator must be now also a function of the different channels, and they can mix. And I still assume that there is free propagation of the excited uh, of the electrons between the sides, so this part of the propagation does not change, but the T matrices, the scattering part, this will change and become a channel dependent quantity. And now here, this is all total energy, this is a total energy, the ground state energy plus the photon energy, so the total final ener state energy. Okay. <coughs> now, with, and if you assume that the, so this is now quite a complicated big matrix and we want to make it more simple. And for X-ray absorption spectroscopy at least, we can assume that the uh, correlation is only on the absorber side. And if you do so, we can simplify this problem much more. So this, this uh, multi-channel T matrix would be non-diagonal only at the absorber side. This is my assumption. And then uh, I can reduce that to one side problem and the normal multiple scattering problem and the one side um, multi-channel problem. Okay, this is, I will not go into all details how this works, but there's another formulation which is equivalent, maybe you're more familiar, is to, to do exactly the same thing here. So you have the normal single particle scattering path operator minus a perturbation, a kernel. Okay, and this kernel is then essentially the difference between the multi-channel T matrix and the single channel T matrix. That's all. And then you can, this is totally equivalent, and this is maybe more fam familiar. It's like a Dyson equation uh, approach. Okay, so you need to, un to calculate this multi-channel T matrix, and then it's s solved. So, as I said, the remaining problem is to calculate the multi-channel T matrix for the absorber atom. And um, Rino Natoli suggested to do that by solving these multi-channel equations and it can be done in principle but it's extremely hard because the multi-channel, the interchannel potential is um, non-local and channel dependent of course and orthogonality is important at the edge and so on and so forth. It's very hard. It has been done in atomic physics but it's very hard for simple, uh, except for simple multiplet structures. Instead, one can use the so-called R matrix techniques, which were only also introduced in nuclear and then atomic physics. And this is, the, what is the R matrix? It's a multi-channel generalization of the logarithmic derivative. So if you have studied well scattering theory, you know that in order to find the phase shift, you have to integrate your Schrodinger equation inside your atom and then find the logarithmic derivative on the sphere boundary. Once you have that, you match with a free uh, <coughs> solution outside, then you have solved the problem. And so if now your problem inside the atom is very complicated, not just a one channel problem, but a coupled problem, then it gets complicated, but you can generalize this concept of the logarithmic derivatives for such a problem, and this is exactly what we call the R matrix. And there exist several types of R matrices. The most popular is the so-called wigner eisenboot R matrix method, which I have not used. <laughs> but there's another one with the variational R matrix methods that I'm going to use now. And this goes back to Walter Kohn, Nobel Prize in Chemistry, who, in, not, for that, not for this discovery, <laughs> as you know, for DFT. Um, in 1948, he showed that um, there is a variational principle for the logarithmic derivative, for the scattering problem. And this can be formulated in this way, where B is essentially this logarithmic derivative of our wave functions at uh, the boundary of a sphere. And E is the energy, H is a Hamiltonian, L is the so-called Bloch operator, which makes this derivative, and Q is the projector on the sphere. Okay, you don't need to go into detail, but the point is that if you calculate this object and vary it, there's a variation principle, so the minimum will be the best uh, approximation. 
So you all know that the Schoener equation and the raleigh ritz variational principle are equivalent. So this is similar, but here's a little bit different now. <coughs> you fix the energy. It's for continuum problem. So you fix the energy. You lo don't look for the energy. You fix the energy, but you look for the proper uh, logarithmic derivative. Okay, this is in inverting the problem. So the, if you solve this problem here, you get solutions, which are the logarithmic derivatives called BK and the corresponding eigenfunctions. And these solutions have the property that they are solutions of the Schrodinger equation inside the sphere, and they have a particular, a given logarithmic derivative on the sphere. These are called the eigenchannels. Now, to solve a relation principle, the most simple method is always to expand it in a basis set, and that's what everybody does, and I also did. So you set up a set of trial functions and with coefficients, which are determined by solving then a linear algebra problem. So a eigenvalue problem. Now, this is not a simple eigenvalue problem because you have to put in more uh, functions than is the rank of the matrix. So this is a, a generalized eigenvalue problem, but it's not a problem uh, numerically because there are many routines who, that can treat such problems. So this is, has to be computed. Now I come back to physics and say um, we are using for all example I'll show you later such a wave function which is uh, uh, in the case of a 2p uh, core level uh, spectra a 2p5 uh, wave functions and one electron in the continuum and so this is suppo supposed to be an anti-symmetrized anti product between a one 2p5 eigenstate so one whole eigenstate, and one electron in the continuum. And then you have this coefficient, as I said. And then plugging that into the uh, matrix method, you will find the eigen channels. And from that, it's once you have the R matrix, it's easy to calculate the T matrix. And then you put it into the multiple uh, scattering path operator, and then the problem is solved. So <coughs> here is a sum over. Now, how do I develop this? Now I have to develop these uh, functions. We need trial functions in the R matrix method. So I don't have just one radial wave function, but I have several of them. So here's the example. In the case of a 3D-like wave function, uh, you will have... Um, so you, you need the completeness of this basis function, not only in terms of energy, but also in terms of logarithmic derivatives, which means that you have to take very different logarithmic derivatives. And we call that open channels and closed channels. So this is an open channel, which means the logarithmic derivative is zero at the boundary, and there's a closed channel where the amplitude is zero. And you have to mix at least two of them <laughs> different, otherwise it will not work. And then you take as many as you like, uh, excited states, higher, so with more nodes, in order to be complete also in terms of energy. Okay. It turns out that you don't need many, but okay, this is numerics. I will come back to it. Okay, I will try to be quick on this one. What I'm interested here is the exchange interaction, the multiplet effects, and I have not really made progress in the Coulomb screening effect. So I use for the charge screening the same what most people do in X-ray absorption spectroscopy, which is a static screening. And in order to calculate correctly, I have separated the monopole term of the particle hole interaction from the rest. This part only will be treated in static screening, and the rest will be treated on the multi channel level. But I will not go much into detail, I don't have time. Now, I <coughs> show you some examples that come out of such calculations. So, here's the first thing we did is the calcium, different compounds of calcium. So here's calcium oxide, <coughs> uh, monoxide. So here is the spectrum of the uh, 2p extra absorption, so LH extra absorption. Now the LH is spin orbit split, so we'll see two lines at least. But here you see four, this is because there is a crystal ligand field. So we have essentially four peaks. Now ligand field theory can explain that, of course. And uh, that's the spectrum. So now if we did a naive one electron DFT calculation, what would we get? First, neglecting the cohole altogether. Then, this uh, absorption spectrum is essentially a partial density of states. 
with the orbital projection that is um, possible for that particular extra absorption. And in this case, it's just a D, calcium D, uh, D-like density of states. So you take whatever code and calculate the D density of states of the calcium oxide, calcium D. And then you get such a function. And then you have to add it once for L3, for the 2P3 half, and once again for the LP, uh, 2P1 half. And they have a Brent ratio, intensity ratio for 2 to 1. And this is what happens if you try to calculate the spectrum in a normal uh, one electron <coughs> um, theory with, um, yeah, for extra absorption. And you look at the spectrum, of course, it looks no way like the experiment. So now we have forgotten the core hole. Of course, we know that core hole is important. It changes very much the potential that the excited electron feels. So we can use this statically screened uh, core hole potential. If you do that, you get such a kind of spectrum, which looks already much better, much sharper lines, but the intensities are totally off and there are so some peaks missing. And now if you put on top of that this 2P3D multiplet effect, then you get a good spectrum. And the same is here, where the effect between the difference between the one particle theory DFT, independent particle theory, and the, cult, uh, the experiment is even more dramatic. And again, we get uh, the right spectrum. So we did the same for titanium oxide. It's the same story. Um, but here it's more interesting because the people did not understand that so well when before we did our calculations. So here's strontium titanide, and there are different polymorphs of titanium oxide, and they all have uh, octahedral coordination of the titanium by oxygen. But there is some distortion, and so on. And of course, the, the crystal is different. Here are the spectra, and the spectra are really different. They're not so different from looking from far, but they are clearly different, and this is very useful to use these differences for fingerprinting of the spectra, and it's used by experimentalists. And <coughs> now you can try to do this calculation with an independent particle picture. You get this one. It does not look no way like experiment. And for the others, the same. And as before, now it's from <laughs> top to bottom. You put the core hole statically, also in single channel. You get much better peak uh, positions, but no good post peak intensities. And in the multi channel version, you get very good agreement. In particular, what the people had not, uh, could not managed before was to get this splitting here, right, between this, um, it's a EG, L3 EG line, which is extra split. And the interpretation was always, this is a distortion effect. But some people have already said, this is not true, because if you do the calculate the ligand field, it's slightly distorted. But this is not enough to explain that. And in this theory, it came out properly. And uh, that is not a distortion effect can be shown if I take a titanium O7 cluster, a simple thing that is sometimes good enough. You get, <coughs> with the coupling, you get this kind of spectrum between the anatas and the rutile, and it's almost the same. In particular, you don't get any splitting here. But if you now increase the cluster size, I'm using real space multiple scattering like FEF or DJ or many others, then you increase the cluster size here, and then you at seven, so the, the octahedron, you get the ligand field splitting, but without the extra splitting. And only if you have a much larger cluster, at about 60 atoms, you get the right crystal field splitting. So this means it's not a local distortion effect, but it's a long range band structure effect. Okay, we can also use this theory for molecules. If you have the good potential, which is maybe difficult to make the good potential, the, the static DFT potential. And I tried here for titanium chloride, and it works also reasonably well. And I will show, maybe I skip that one and show you the, I don't have so much time, I think. I will rather show you other calcium compounds. I will show you rather this one. This is our latest uh, uh, application vanadium pentoxide, and well, it is a complex, more complex, it's a certain distorted uh, structure. And so you can, first of all, analyze the things by looking at the density of states. And if you take just the ground cell potential, you see that there is all the different D 
levels have different spectra, so this reflects the high anisotropy of this local structure. But we know that we rather look at the final state potential with the hole in the <coughs> core hole, and then it's the same thing, and then you see nicely the ligand field splittings in a simple DFT calculation. So it's a low symmetry thing. And if you now do the spec calculate the spectra, again in independent particle picture, we get this type of spectra depending on the final state uh, screening model. But in all ways, it's not good. And if you take the multi-channel method, we get a good agreement. And what I want to stress here is that if you, <coughs> this multi-channel coupling does not only mix the L3 and L2 channel, but it mixes all around the ligand fields, the ligand field terms. So if you just calculate the transitions to one of the D states, like X, Y, Y, Z, and so on, you get, this is the calculation of the multi-channel, but only certain channels without the coupling between the channels. And if you sum them all together, you, you de don't get at all the total spectrum. It means that the interference between the different channels is crucial. Okay, you can see it, for example, x, y, the L3 to L2 is, is 2 to 1, but it's not at all here like that. It's the opposite. So the interference between the different channels, the interchannel coupling is the important thing. Okay, <coughs> and here we did then the polarization dependence, and it also works quite well. So I will have to skip all that because I'm a bit late. We did also um, oxygen uh, vacancies. So well, maybe I, 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 <coughs> I just show that very quickly. So if you have oxygen vacancies, which are very common in, in transmittal oxides, of course, very important for all chemical applications, then of course you, your structure changes and you might see that by using X-ray absorption spectroscopy. So we have tried to understand what happens, and if you, the perfect crystal is like here, I have shown before, if you make oxygen vacancies at different sites, you get some relaxation, and we calculate it with VASP and so on, and then you get different spectra, of course, <coughs> and the biggest effect is, for example, for this OV, where is it? Here, and we have this very strong relaxation, you see the, the vanadium was here first, and now it goes down, if you remove the vanadyl, if you cut the vanadyl bond, then it is a very strong relaxation, so you get a very strong change of the spectrum. And uh, this is, turns out to be the most stable oxygen vacancy as well, so it's uh, interesting. So it turns out that the changes in the LH spectrum of vanadium are bigger than the changes in the KH spectra of vanadium. No, not, not, they are also big spectra. But these spectra are often used for structural analysis, and this not much, but one should do it, especially in eel spectroscopy, where you cannot reach these kind of uh, levels. Okay, <coughs> uh, so so I've shown you this uh, multi-channel multiple scattering in our matrix formulation. At the moment, we have only the particle hole picture. Okay, we tried a lot to go beyond that. And I could talk long about it, but it's not was not always successful. Now we did one trial, and it was just one slide to tell you that. We, with our matrix method, we could not go further than the particle hole picture, and there is a chance that you can go further by going back to the original formulation by Rino Natoli, and so calculating this interchannel potential. This is a very hard task, and uh, we formulated in a, a two-particle multi-channel density matrix with such such objects. And if everything works well, you get from this two-particle density matrix. You can calculate the potential, the interchannel potential, from which you can calculate the wave function, of course, and then can even cycle that. That would be the idea. The formula are there. If you're interested, please read this paper. But uh, it's not coded yet, so we don't know if it really works in practice. And if you want to code it, you're welcome. So, <coughs> so this is the summary. Um, maybe I skip that. I mean. The important thing is it's a configuration interaction method between continuum electron and bound electrons. And the particle hole multiplets effect from are uh, well described, and you get excellent results for light transition elements where these uh, effects are strongest. Okay, now I come to the second part, which is the beta sit beta salpeta equation. And so I don't know exactly what uh, Professor Janisch uh, told you in, on last uh, Tuesday, I think, or, or Wednesday. Um, <coughs> but I will only talk about it, how it's used in extra absorption, uh, optical absorption, extra absorption spectroscopy. 
But as I said, I'm not really an expert, so maybe there are better experts in the, in the audience. Um, so the beta cell pater equation was formulated in 1951 by Hans Peter and Edwin Salpeter. Uh, a relativistic equation for to bound state problems. And if you look up Wikipedia even, you can get this formula here, which means that you will try to find the Green's function, the two-particle Green's function. It's an equation for the two-particle Green's function. And it, the ingredients are the single-particle Green's functions, which are called here S, S1, S2, and the K, which is the kernel. So it looks again like a Dyson equation. There is kind of the free Green's function, which is just a product in this case. The free Green's function for the two-particle problem is a product of the two one-particle Green's functions. And then there's a kernel, and this is a Dyson-like equation. So this was uh, beta sal beta. They wanted to do that really for two particles. And you have kind of bound state catching one the other. And they can use this one. Now we are in condensed matter, and therefore we are <coughs> probably interested in not really also two particles, but embedded two particles moving in a, a dielectricum or in a condensed matter. So more generally, the BSE is a Dyson-like equation for any two-particle problem, not necessarily for bound states. But it will have the strongest effects when there is strong interaction between these two particles, which are give a bound state or close to it, a resonance to a bound state. And these resonances are called excitonic effects. I think you know what is an exciton. It's a bound state between a particle and a hole very important in semiconductors. And so if these effects are strong, the beta salpeter equation is very useful. So <coughs> uh, I want to be pedagogical, because the beta salpeter equation is a complicated thing. So you need to know Green's functions and all that. And you have heard a lot about it. But I, I will quickly remind a few things about Green's function. Maybe it's a bit redundant for you, who have already started now Green's function for a week. But um, I will do it anyway. Um, I, I do that for also for one reason, because there is a little bit difficult for the beginner to understand what it means, this Green's functions. Because especially in this lecture here, in this workshop, you will there are many people coming from scattering theory, where the Green's functions are very important. And then there are people from many body theory, where the Green's functions are equally very important, but not exactly the same thing. And so to clear that up a little bit, I made this slide here. No, first, I will talk about, uh, again, the Green's function in scattering theory. So you have a free system, say a free particle. This is a Hamiltonian, it's only the kinetic energy. <coughs> then you can solve that, and you have free waves, phi. And then you add a potential, scattering potential, V, and then your Hamiltonian is this one. And you, would, if you, you can write the Schrodinger equation in this way. And you add the two equations, and then you multiply by E minus h0 minus 1, and then you get this equation. You add and multiply by the inverse, you can get this equation. And this is the lippmann schwinger equation. Okay? And it couples, <coughs> it, it connects the true Green's function, uh, the, 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 the interacting uh, wave function with the free wave function, the Green's free propagator and the T-matrix, where this one uh, defines the T-matrix. OK, <coughs> um, now you can also play the game for the full Green's function and define the gr full Green's function with the Hamiltonian directly. And then you get to the same kind of series, the V Green's function and the Born series. And you can say G0 plus G0 plus T uh, G0 again. OK, now if you look at plane wave states to calculate the matrix element of this uh, Green's function, the free Green's function now, uh, then it's very easy to see that you have to calculate just the matrix element of this operator. And this is, of course, diagonal in the <coughs> uh, momenta and uh, 1 over E minus the eigenstates. OK, I think you all know that. Now let's go to the Green's function in many body theory. This is not exactly the same thing, although it's very closely related. The definition of the one particle Green's function. There are many of them, but let's focus on the retarded Green's function. 
is written here. Where here this means that you, you create a particle at position r prime t prime on the ground set of your many body system. And then you destroy a particle at a later time r and t. And there's a commutator. So it gives a probability amplitude for a particle rt if one was added at r prime t prime. And if you are able to calculate this Green's function, it gives you physically the one particle addition or removal spectrum. Actually, both. And this is directly related to the direct or inverse photo emission and can be compared with the experiment. And this is, of course, what Jan and others do when they calculate opposite. So if you have now interacting part, uh, interacting, non interacting system, you can write your Hamiltonian always in this way, and then uh, you diagonalize your. You can analyze the atom exactly, and you have the band and the free electron, uh, the, the eigenvalues epsilon k. Then the Green's function is immediately given by this form. And so you see that this form is omega minus epsilon k. This is the same as here if I change e to omega, which is the same thing. Okay? So we see here in the non interacting system, the scattering Green's function and the and many body Green's functions are the same. But I think the analogy stops here. If we come further, I, there are changes. So now we go to the interacting system. In the interacting system, we have now a Green's function which takes into account all these correlations. The Hamiltonian is more complicated with scattering effects, I mean, with interaction. And then, usually, the Green's function cannot be calculated exactly anymore. But you can always simplify the problem by introducing what's called the self energy. And the self energy can be defined in this way or in this way, which is totally equivalent. And you can also do it with diagrammatic perturbation theory, and you will find that uh, if you have an approximation for the self energy, you will have an infinite series of processes, of diagrams for the Green's function. So it simplifies the things, but you can also see it as a uh, definition. So this looks very much like our scattering problem if you look here, replace the sigma by v. Then it's exactly, again, the, the Born <coughs> uh, yeah, the equation that I've shown you before. So, in short, in scattering theory, you have such an equation with v here, with a scattering potential. And in many body theory, you, you have a sigma here, which is called the self-energy. So. If you now <coughs> look at the, uh, the most simple case, which is free space or a crystal, and then you have block waves, but let's think about free space, it's even easier. Then we have seen the G0, of course, this is the, the Green's function, the free Green's function. Now, if you um, add, um, uh, sorry, not free space was not correct, I mean homogeneous space, okay? Homogeneous space, but you have many electrons, the electricum, but you have uh, translational symmetry. So k is a good quantum number. Then the Green's function by Fourier transform from here, uh, this is the free Green's function as I said, and it's obvious that by symmetry that also self-energy depends only on k and omega. So you can write down your solution of the Green's function in this way and you have to find sigma of k and omega. But by interpret the meaning, physical meaning of this object now is that the eigen states, so the, the bands, or the, the quasi-particle eigenstates, as we call them, are shifted okay, by the real part of the self-energy. So there are two effects of the interaction. One is the shift of the, the bands, and the other one, this is a complex number now, and you, so you have an imaginary part, and the imaginary part will uh, show up as a lifetime of your quasi-particles. I will not go into detail. Okay, <coughs> so this is the physical meaning of this. So, um, now, self-energy calculation is difficult, and one popular uh, self-energy approximation is the GW approximation. I don't know if you heard about this last week. Um, anyway, I will <laughs> quickly introduce it very shortly. So you can calculate self-energy by many-body perturbation theory and other techniques, but uh, a very interesting new approach was given by Hedin in the 60s, <coughs> and he said that we can make a set of um, closed system of equations to solve the many-body pro many problem exactly. And the closed 
set of equations involves the Green's function, the surf energy, the polarization function, and the screen interaction, and the so-called vertex function. And they are all coupled together, and I will not show the, the equations, it's not the point. If we could if, uh, solve these coupled equations exactly, we would have solved the many-body problem, but of course this is not possible. So you have to somewhere make approximation, and Hayden suggested to neglect the vertex, so-called vertex function, and then it comes to the uh, GW approximation. And this GW approximation, so it's an approximation for the self-energy, and it works, it's very successful for weakly correlated systems such as semiconductors. So I will very quickly try to explain that. So you, uh, everybody knows what is the Coulomb energy <coughs> between two electrons. This is the potential. This is in free space. Now if you put these two electrons in a dielectricum, polariza polarizable medium, then the interaction will be smaller. And the reason is, which you all know from <laughs> first year of university or even before, is that the dielectric constant is no longer epsilon zero of free space, but it's epsilon of the dielectric constant of the medium. And this is usually larger. It's always larger. So since this epsilon r, or copper, some call it, if it's five, then the interaction is five times weaker. Okay, and this is called the screening. Because the rest electrons, they arrange in such a way, they're polarized, they rearrange in such a way that the, elect the, the two selected electrons will not feel such a strong interaction anymore. And statically, it's not difficult. This is enough. But now we are interested in complicated dynamic phenomena, and then it gets a little bit more complicated. <coughs> in general, if you don't put these electrons statically, but you let them move, then uh, it's no longer just one constant, but it's a dielectric function which depends at least on the distance between the two electrons and on the frequency. Okay, so you have then the dielectric functions, but otherwise it's the same. See, this is the Coulomb interaction, 1 over epsilon, this is epsilon r, becomes epsilon minus 1 r minus prime, and you have to integrate over uh, the second variable, <coughs> and this is then the uh, dynamically screened Coulomb interaction. So for me this was the <laughs> easiest way to understand that. So if you are interested in more you can, might read for example this paper then you it's much better explained. So this is the screened uh, so what you need to calculate the screened Coulomb interaction is the some approximation for the dielectric function. And so <coughs> I should start here. So the it is the same thing here again. Okay, so if you have the screen Coulomb interaction, you, if you have an approximation to epsilon minus one, you can calculate by integration the uh, screen Coulomb interaction. Once you have the screen Coulomb interaction, you multiply or convolute with a G0 with our free Green's function without interaction, uh, and then you get the self-energy. That's why it's called GW, because it's a product of G and W. Okay, and once you have this, you have to invert solve the Dyson equation and you get then the Green's function. So what we need is the epsilon minus one and what everybody uses is the random phase approximation which uh, calculates the dielectric constant in this way where this chi zero is the uh, <coughs> non-interacting uh, electric susceptibility which you can calculate from the bands from the particle hole it, in, uh, excitations. I don't go into detail. So it's called RPA and this is well established. So from that you can then solve all this. It's numerically very hard, but can be done. And this is what comes out. The biggest success I think still to date is that GW corrects the band gaps of semiconductors amazingly well, while d density function theory underestimates sometimes dramatically the band gaps. Not always, but very often. So here is a curve uh, a diagram from this paper showing the <coughs> band gaps for different compounds and uh, plotted in such a way that uh, if the, well, on the diagonal is the experimental value. So <coughs> uh, LDA is too small. If you put GW here in blue, water blue, you get very close to the experimental value. So this is the, was a big, big success. 
So, and I'm, I'm telling you this uh, GW approximation because it's very often used in combination with the beta sub beta equation. So finally, I come to the beta sub beta equation. And so I already said it, that it's uh, historically an equation for the two-particle bound state problem in quantum field theory. And uh, it's nowadays, at least what I'm interested in, is used very much for the dielectric response or the absorption spectra um, to include the interaction between excited electron and hole. So again, I showed you the Green's functions. With the one particle Green's function, in principle, you cannot calculate absorption spectra. Why? Because it's either removing an electron or adding an electron. So it connects a system with n electrons with one more or one less. But in an optical spectrum, it's not what's happened. In an optical spectrum, is a charge neutral excitation. So you just excite an electron. The number of electrons doesn't change. So you, you cannot use just the single particle Green's function to calculate optical spectrum. Of course you can, <laughs> but this is an approximation. Okay? <coughs> you can always do it, but then you neglect the particle hole interaction. So, <coughs> in principle, in order to calculate an uh, absorption spectrum, you have to start from the two particle, the particle hole Green's function. So now, <coughs> uh, this would be my particle hole Green's function, electron hole where here one, a Green's function just has two coordinates, x and x prime, or I call it now one and two. Uh, this, is for the, this is for the hole, x, x prime for the hole, and this is for the electron, two and two prime. So these are coordinates and spins and so on, all degrees of freedom. So you would, in order to solve the peter sapeter equation, you have to start from the one particle Green's function for the electron, let's call it GE, and for the hole, let's call it GH. This could probably be done with one calculation, because it's the same thing, but for different energies. <coughs> so you, have, you need these two, and you can do it in any approximation you like, but many people use the GW approximation, because it works well to get the band gap right, and so on and so forth. So let's say we need the single part of Green's function for the electron hole in the GW approximation. You have calculated that already. And now you want the two-particle Green's function written here. So if you neglect the particle hole interaction, it's just a product between the two. And in reality, they do interact, so it's more complicated. And the interaction is what? Well, it's a Coulomb interaction, as always. So I showed you before in the multi-channel case. The particle and the hole attract each other. This gives, this is the trouble. So, <coughs> you can formulate that, again, in a kind of Dyson equation way. So you say this is the free thing, plus the free thing times the kernel times the full thing. It's the Dyson equation. So it's, it's the, the kernel here uh, plays the role of the self-energy in uh, the normal Green's function. And it's kind of the difference between the free and the full Green's function inverse. Okay. <coughs> So, the kernel is taken as the screen Coulomb interaction with our, which I have introduced before, plus the bare exchange. This is very important that you have also the exchange interaction. And this is not taken, screened. Don't ask me why. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, this describes very well excitonic effects. And it's very accurate for one electron, one hole interaction. But it lacks, well, which very good. <laughs> um, I'll come back later. So in practice, what do you have to do if you really want to do the calculation? Uh, you know, you want to calculate this Green's function, but the, by the Green's function, the Green's function is essentially the inverse of the Hamiltonian times the energy. So you always have to diagonalize somehow the Hamiltonian. Of course, the other methods, and we, especially multiple scaring, is a different method. It doesn't work this way. It rather works by inversion. But most people who work with uh, basis set approaches, they will do this approach, finding the eigenvalues of and eigenstates of this two-particle problem. So <coughs> we, will look, we will look for the eigenstates of the two-particle electron hole uh, Hamiltonian. And then you, you set up basis states with all quantum numbers, with all possible states for the hole and for the electron. 
And now we uh, think about a crystal. We have a Bloch crystal momentum K. And you will choose the same K for the electron and the hole. Why is that? Because the total momentum K is a difference. The hole goes back. So the total momentum is Ke minus Kh. And this is conserved in the process. Okay, the, the photon will not change the total momentum of the system. It's neglected. I mean, the photon momentum is neglected. So <coughs> this means that you could do it for each total k differently. Now, we only need k equals 0, big K equals 0, because the ground state is, has a, it does not move, so it's a total momentum 0. Okay? So we have to calculate this thing only for big K equals 0, meaning Ke equal Kh. So this means that H and K, the hole has a K and the electron has the same K. And these are our basis states. So you have to take all <coughs> band states for the hole with a certain K and the electron and couple them. And then set up, again, such a combined uh, two-particle wave function and with coefficients to be optimized. So then you diagonalize the Hamiltonian. <coughs> and here I copied this from lavskovsky blaha uh, So the eigenvalue problem is you want to solve. And uh, well, they have diagonal elements. You have just the particle hole e energies itself, and then some mean field uh, shift. And then you have the direct and the exchange terms, which are the complicated integrals. So you need, again, the screen Coulomb interaction. And here you see this is, this is a direct term, because here the hole is, say, at x, and the other is, is, is for the, on the same side. I mean, it's, it's psi, psi star for the hole with the same x. And here it's psi at x and psi star of the hole at x prime. So here electron and hole are exchanged. This is the exchange term. OK, now I stop with the theory. As I said, I'm not really an expert, so you can still try to ask me questions. <laughs> and I'll show you a little bit what the people have uh, found with the uh, beta salpeter equation. So there are many publications, of course. I found this one in 2002 by uh, Pushnik, <coughs> I think, uh, and uh, Ambrosch Draxel. So they looked at uh, silicon optical spectra. Now, this is not X-ray. This is just optical spectra. You see the excitation energy is three from 3 EV. The band gap is 3 EV. It's, it's a lot. <laughs> anyway, OK. Uh, <coughs> And so there they compare here the RPA, which is the simplest many-body theory. And this gives this line. The, the experiment is here. It's much sharper here. It's much higher in the, in the threshold here. So this is a little bit of an excitonic effect. If you have a sharp line, a threshold, this indicates excitonic effect. But it's not so strong here. But now when you put the BSE, the beta sapir equation, you get the, the thick line here. And it looks much better. Now, the effect is much, much stronger in a system like lithium fluoride, which is very insulating and it has strong excitonic effects. You can see that directly in optical spectra very easily. So if you just do RPA, you get such a spectrum. It looks very, very different from experiment. Experiment are the points. And BSE looks, gives a very good sharp peak here. Uh, here, for the second peak, it's not perfect. But overall, it's very good. So these were optical spectra. You see uh, energy is about. 3 or 10 EV. And now I will do the X-ray regime, which I'm mostly interested. And the first person who applied this BSE to X-ray absorption, I think, is Eric Shirley in 1980, 1998. Published this paper, where he passed, again, lithium fluoride, because it has very strong exotonic effects, and other fluorides. And here you can see his uh, experimental spectrum. So this is the fluorine KH spectra, which have a excitation energy around 700 EV. And here's the experimental spectrum for lithium, sodium, uh, potassium, fluoride. And if you're in a one electron theory, you just get this peak it's totally off. Shape, position, everything is off. So that's very bad. <coughs> However, if you take into account uh, this uh, particle hole interaction with the BSE, you get quite good uh, agreement with the experiment. So this cl clearly proved that um, people have known it before for optical spectra, but also for X-ray spectra, that you have these strong exotonic effects. And you can get these effects well with a BSE. And later on, he applied also the theory to LS spectra here in the case of strontium titanite, which I showed you before. And he explained nicely what different terms do. And in the end, he also gets quite a good, uh, quite a good spectrum for the LH. 
And here I show you another paper which is very much related to what I did. They published just a little after me. Uh, the same problem, strontium titanite titanium or anatasin rutile. And uh, well, I don't show the independent part of the picture, which is very bad. And with the beta salpeter here in this uh, very accurate VIN2K uh, linear augmented plane wave method by Blaha and others, they put the BSE and they calculate all the spectra. And you can see that it's quite good. It's very good for these. Now they also applied it to not the uh, empty shell, but uh, other um, transition metal oxides. And there it was surprising for me good, but of course it will not give you all the multiplets. So this is because <coughs> all I've shown you today is particle hole theories. They cannot give you all the multiplets correctly for an open shell system. Okay, so if you're interested in using BSE, first thing you need is a big computer. And <laughs> you can uh, use then any of these codes. Um, I probably I forgot a lot. A lot of people have now implemented Peter Salpeter equation. And as I said, Shirley was the first, and I think it's, his code is now with Ocean, I think. Then V2K was the other paper I showed you. This is the FLUP method, and uh, exciting, and many others. Uh, so I should stop here, I stop here, but I can... Yeah, another two minutes. Okay. <laughs> I'm almost done. So, um, for the LH spectrum, which I have uh, told you a lot about, I mean, in this case, multi-channel and BSE are essentially equivalent, I would say. For the uh, exotonic effects, in case of lithium fluoride and so on and so forth, uh, the multi-channel theory does not work well. Well, it's what I would you, you, it's just a final state rule that I use. This is what most people use. So, um, in general, apart from these multiplet effects, extra absorption, the core problem is very important. Everybody knows it, and they are the most popular approach to treat the core hole uh, effect is the so-called final state rule, which means that you calculate the potential for the final state calculation with a, a hole, a constraint. You put a, an ex a hole, you, you remove an electron from the core level, and then you calculate the potential self-consistently to let the electrons relax, let this hole be screened. And this is static screening, okay? And it's called the final state rule. This is very much used. You can use that in a finite cluster, or you can use it in a supercell approach. <coughs> And uh, BSE is different. So here I compare these two approaches a little bit. So the final state rule is much more flexible. You, as I just said, you can use it, you don't need periodicity, you can use it for anything, periodic or not. Crystals, I think BSE at the moment is only implemented for crystals. And yeah, <coughs> so the computation model here is that in order to treat this impurity problem with a core hole, you need here either supercell, big supercell actually, or a large cluster. And in the BSE node, you only need the unit cell. Looks much better. But <coughs> the size of your problem, of your electronic problem, is the double because you have you need all the electron hole excitations. Okay, for as I said before, you, you don't use only for a certain the whole states all the K, but now also the electron states. So all the bands. So it's kind of n squared. So it's very heavy. Now, in terms of physics, the screening. As I said, final state rule is a static screening, while the BSE is a dynamic screening. So it, it has, while this has only relaxation, this has also relaxation and exchange. Uh, in this case, you get no multiplet effects. In this case, you get particle hole effects, but not more. <coughs> so the advantage, I would say, here is very flexible and relatively light. And this is very accurate when you have such effects. Okay, uh, I skip that, and uh, thank you for your attention. So, are there questions? Yeah. I have a question regarding the results you showed for the GW uh, approximation. GW, yes. Uh, GW. 
This one? Yes. Mm -hmm. And after <coughs> you perform a GW. Yes, yes, yes. I think that's what the people did. So here it says LDA, GW. So you start from a DFT calculation, yeah. mm, get the normal Green's function, uh, one part of the Green's function, calculate, uh, and then they calculate the screened Coulomb interaction. That's it. So, if, uh, Absolutely. Now this is subtracted. This is subtracted. Yeah, yeah. So you set up, you take away, instead of when you put the self-energy, you remove the exchange correlation potential, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you, you, you replace the exchange correlation potential of DFT by the self-energy. In this way, you should not have a double counting, but maybe in the orbitals, yeah, because the orbitals are already calculated by LDA, it's maybe not, I don't know, Seth. You get a kind of double counting via the W. Excuse me? You get a kind of double counting via the, oh. the W. I see. Yeah, yeah. Because the same interaction is effectively the same as the uh -huh. <laughs> okay. It is not double counting the, the main Coulomb interaction. Thank you. Unfortunately not. <laughs> if we had the Lehmann representation, we had solved the problem. The Lehmann representation is an exact formula for the many electron for a certain um, spectrum or excited state, right? So if you can calculate that, you have solved the problem. Yeah, Unfortunately, we have yeah, not solved the problem. Just about calculation, just about how we want to describe the physics of the system. Mm. I don't know. Uh, honestly, I don't know what. I mean, there's always a sort of strong connection beque between any many body theory and the Lehmann representation. You can always make this co connection. I don't know why this would be particularly the case for the multi channel. Yeah, in the sense that if you. Well, uh, maybe now I get your. Point. I mean, since you do configuration in the very beginning idea, if you could solve really this problem tot exactly, so you get really your n minus one electron spectrum, and then you get all the solved the coupled equations, then it would be exact solution to the problem, and therefore you would have something like the Lehmann representation. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> uh, yeah. Can you say it again? I didn't catch everything. Uh, just uh, when you solve base factor equation, it's because we should to, say to choose an irre irreducible vertex at the kernel to solve this base factor equation. So which kernel you use? Uh, I think, as I said, the kernel of the. Uh, just because we choose the base factor equation is something like the gamma equals the, I mean the lambda plus lambda g, g, g gamma. And then the lambda is the ker kernel in the electron hole channel. So which, uh, I mean, which irreducible vertex you use when you solve the best subject Um, You mean in the el many electron diagramic? Mm -hmm, yes, because you say that you first solve the GW and the yeah. single particle green, green function, and yeah. then solve the best subject equation. Yeah. So I'm curious, the, I mean, the irreducible kernel you use. Yeah. Well, I couldn't now destroy you the diagram that exactly corresponds to the beta sal peter kernel. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, uh, um, yeah, since it's a screen Coulomb interaction, it's a renormalized. Well, uh, honestly, maybe I cannot answer correctly about it, but the <coughs> uh, it's a self consistent since it's a kernel function is a self-consistent approach, so you get uh, an infinite series of, uh, of uh, um, processes, but maybe I don't get your... Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, 
satisfactory answer to your question. I'm sorry. Absolutely. And only to say in the case when I'm concerned about the absorption spectrum, and then in, in this case, I need the two particle green, green function, and then to say uh, I need to solve the BSE in this case. Yes. Yes. Of course, you can always use such things like beta sub beta in equation to improve also any other Green's function. You know, if you have a one particle Green's function, and you make the hierarchy you, the equation of motion, you get to a two particle Green's function, and you can say for that one, I use a beta it's a beta sub beta equation. Like you could do that. Yes, but, but in principle, your answer, my short answer, yes, you're right. You don't need it. I don't I don't use Peter sub Peter equation. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but in sense in, in the sense that the multi channel multi bit scarcity is equivalent to some sense to the Peter simple equation? Yes. The answer is yes. Yes, <laughs> but a single side. Hmm? Also single side, yeah, yeah. Very good question. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for this one. <laughs> yes, it's in progress. <laughs> By the way, here we have uh, sadly, sadly, in the last application, <laughs> oh no, sorry, sadly, sadly, here we had the left, no, the, the left, the LH spectra are multi channel but muffin tin. <laughs> the right is full potential. <laughs> But no multi, multi channel, but you don't need multi channel for this one. <laughs> and the, in principle, we want to do things together, but it's in progress. Yeah. Mm. I, I'd tell you in private more about it. It's maybe too long a story. Yeah. Okay, mm. Nice. Mm. okay, so let's thank you again. Ah. Oh, there's an answer to your question. <laughs> uh -huh.